The Lawyer Who Rocks is brought to you by Q's Media Law Group. You can visit HMLG at hmlglaw.com. Keep up with the podcast on social media at HMLG Law on all major platforms and be sure to follow us there. Thank you for listening and enjoy this episode of The Lawyer Who Rocks. My name is Jolene Winther Hughes. I am a lawyer who rocks. Welcome to part two of my interview with the remarkable gardener, Robin Haglin. Today, we are going to dive deeper into her business garden mentors, her advice for those looking to start gardening, and of course, what makes Robin a badass. Please enjoy. Tell me about all the different aspects of garden mentors and what it's evolved into. I do a lot of different things with garden mentors. The name itself speaks to garden coaching and consulting. So up until COVID, I would work a lot hand in hand in the garden with individuals wanting to learn about gardening. And that could be anything learning about gardening. Some people would have me come and just tell them what their plants were. Other people would have me come and tell them what plants to put in with their other plants. Some would want even deeper listens. Many would want design. So I also do garden design, whether that's just giving you ideas or doing full on garden designs. I'm not a landscape architect, though, which is an entirely different beast. I also added on doing writing. I've written a blog for a long time. I've been doing a lot of cleanup on it this year, and there's loads of free information up there for anyone. That also then helped me get jobs working for tool companies like Fiskars. I wrote for them for years. Also doing script writing and research for an Emmy award-winning PBS program, Growing a Greener World. I've also been on several episodes. They used my garden in Seattle as a set. Often some of my clients' gardens, they featured me as a garden coach. So I've done all of those things. Of course, did compete in HGTV's Landscapers Challenge right out of school. Like that was kind of crazy to get that gig and to win. My garden was installed. That was huge. And then, you know, having done all this work to get, you know, the idea of garden coaching out there, I was really lucky to get picked up in Sunset Magazine and the New York Times at the same time. And that was huge. Writing, designing, garden coaching, consulting, speaking. I've been a speaker at the Northwest Garden Show. COVID throws my numbers off, but I think it's like 13 years in a row. Keynote speaking for Master Gardener seminars, online, in person, all these sorts of things, you know, I speak, I teach, you know, I'm a lifelong student. You know, you can't be a good teacher if you aren't always learning. And one of my passions and interests has always been around food, growing food and herbs. And that was a spot that I really started pursuing most recently, really looking into herbalism and studying all sorts of different medicinal properties of different plants. And out of that ended up building a line of products I sell on Etsy that are salves and balms and mists. And almost everything is either homegrown or foraged out of Skagit County in Northwest Washington, where I live. That's one of my goals is to try to keep everything as local as I can there. So I do all of these things. I also teach lessons in doing that. And then of course, now I have built the Garden Mentors Online Learning Academy. So that's a way that I can teach anyone, anywhere, anytime about all of the things I'm passionate about, all aspects of gardening, design, caretaking, building, harvesting, preserving, and then also foraging, crafting, making, all of these really wonderful things that I'm so passionate about. I now finally brought online. It's something I've been wanting to do for a long time, but in the time of COVID, it was like, you know what? I had to do something because I couldn't get up close and personal with people anymore. I couldn't do it. And I wasn't going to watch my baby die. And so once again in life, Robin pivots and does something different. And thank God for my husband, Bob, because he is 
a WordPress developer extraordinaire and technologist that was willing to step up and he already works full time and he's like, let's do this thing. And he really helped me build all of that out, build the e-commerce, set all of that up, think it through, you know, really try to be smart about it. And then also working with my business coach, Teresa Lowe of Streamlined and Scaled, you know, she has been a huge advocate for me. And in fact, she was my boss at Growing a Greener World. She was the person that hired me to write, but she's now segued into this other area and has been really instrumental in helping me work my way through what this becomes and as it continues to evolve. I do a lot of different things. It's interesting looking at some of the statistics that have come out around gardening related to the pandemic. And I was just looking this morning and the statistics I was seeing is that 42% more gardeners came into being in 2020 as a direct result, they say, to the pandemic, most of them gardening at home. And as we're looking at 2021, they're saying at least 86% of those people intend to continue to garden. And a lot of them learned to garden online because nobody could come to them. So I feel like the online academy with my skill set as a trained garden coach and designer is really valuable, right? Neither are the gardeners going away, nor is there need to learn about it because most of those people are new gardeners and are trying to find their success. So this is a way I can be there for them. How did you decide which sort of coursework you were going to divide all of this up into? And feel free to like tell us about the different courses you can take. It took me quite a few months to decide what this program was going to be because I didn't want it to just be another gardening lesson program online. There's a lot of those. I wanted it to be something more holistic. And in fact, that's part of the name of it is Holistic Nature Academy. And as I looked at that, I thought, okay, I want there to be more than just, you know, how to grow a tomato. That's actually something we actually sort of have our inside joke in the house is like, oh, look, another tomato growing course. Oh, here we go. Which, you know, you want to learn how to grow a tomato. I do have a class on that. So, but there's so much more out there that a gardener can be doing. And I really wanted to set the foundation in a lot of the basics. So teaching people about garden caretaking, that's one of the courses is the caretaker course. So you start thinking about what goes into caring for the earth? What goes into your soil? You need to know about the soil. Most of a plant grows under the soil. I wanted it to be about that. You know, one of the things a lot of garden maintenance companies that are good, that aren't just driving around with a mower, will say is they get really frustrated with designers because they don't think about the maintenance. So you can design a garden to the hilt, but if you aren't prepared to take care of it, it's going to be frustrating. So I really wanted to be able to set the foundation for people that wanted to dive that deep. You don't have to. That's part of what my program is about, is that you can take any of the classes in any order you want to take them in. All of them, except for one section, is always available as long as you keep your subscription alive. It's a monthly or annual subscription base recurring. And so you can jump back and forth. I don't force you to finish a class to move to another one. I will make recommendations on some that, you know, you probably don't want to take this class unless you've taken the other one. But I wanted it to have all these different aspects. So you've got your caretaker to learn about like sort of those foundations of gardening. You've got designer. So you can learn how to work with a designer. So if you are thinking about hiring someone, what are some of those terms they're going to throw around? What are those tools? What am I looking at on a design? How does that work? Or you can go onto the designer course and you can download designs that I've created. So you can take professional designs and put them into your garden right away. So I wanted to give those aspects, whether it's food gardening or ornamental gardening. The forager course, which you brought up, is definitely a passion of mine. And one of the most important parts of that course is remembering that with foraging, you have to know what you're looking for. You have to know how to ID plants. You have to ask permission. And my belief about permission isn't just about the landowner that you're going to gather it from, but from the plants and the ecology. So being someone who treads a little lightly and thinking about that. With that, I also have a grower course, which is about growing plants. So it talks about individual plants, as well as other aspects of cultivating, whether it's food or herbs or 
you know, an ornamental plant that you might want in your garden. Harvesting. So that I called it the harvester course, but it's a harvesting and preserving course. So it teaches about how to gather from your garden, as well as ways that you can use what you gather, whether it's something to create ornamentation in your house or whether it's berries you want to freeze, for instance. Maker course is another one. And that one's really about crafting, cooking, and herbalism. So lots of lessons in all of those things. And I have a kind of a cross-platform of how everything's created. Some things are printable, like a design that you would take away or a recipe that you could print and start a recipe book. Some things are video and it depends on what kind of video. So sometimes it's action video, sometimes it's different types of lessons because over the years I've learned, different people learn in different ways. And whenever I've gone in to teach, I always start by saying, the point of me being here is for you to learn. And it's not for me to just sit here and talk. So if you don't understand me, stop me because I might be teaching in a way that doesn't work for you. So stop me and I can regroup and try to present it in a way that helps you. Now, as a teacher, I also can see people glaze over pretty quickly. You know, I recognize it when it happens and know when it's time to kind of, okay, you've had enough, let's pull back and either do something different or regroup on that concept. And then finally in the academy, one other portion is what I call special programs. And that is the one area that comes and goes. I've done interviews with herb farmers. I do a lot of my keynote presentations, like things that you may have wanted to see at the Northwest Flower Garden Show, but couldn't get to my talk that day. So a lot of those pieces go up in multi-part segments. Consuming media, we don't usually want to sit down for an hour or two all at once necessarily. So I try to break things up into bite-sized pieces. So you can study one course for five minutes, or you can sit there and spend hours because there's over 90 lessons. And I don't post how many hours because not everything's hourly content. I have a mix of things. And there is a free version of kind of a mini selection if anybody just wants to try that. So a lot of different things. And I add new content every month. It's so forward thinking about bringing this because you have to sort of adjust to whatever your life is, whether you have children or pets or you're out on acreage or you're in the city, right? Isn't that a lot of what you have to work with? You know, the world isn't perfect. If we expect our gardens to be perfect, then we're really being unrealistic. You know, it's an imperfect world and our dogs are going to chew stuff. My chickens, you know, people talk about how great it is to have chickens. My chickens tear up my garden worse than anything else. I mean, I do all the things and we go out and they tear it up. And I'm like, well, at least you're giving me eggs and you're pooping and fertilizing along the way. When I go into a garden that is pristine, you know, and perfect, I worry because that tells me that there are probably a lot of chemicals being laid down. I mean, the world is chemistry anyway, but by chemicals, you know what I mean? Something out of a box or a sprayer. I worry about that, you know, because we're not doing anything other than creating this false facade when we create a garden like that. I'd rather walk in and see dog holes chewed, you know, chew holes and dog holes and, you know, a couple of chicken scratches and things like that. But that's me. You know, I'm all about our footprint. What do you feel makes a good design? Like, how did you learn or or is this just a natural talent you have? You know, the most important thing to me is to listen to the client and understand what they need out of the space, what they're willing to put into the space. And then also look at the environment and find what's appropriate to the ecology of the landscape I'm looking at, you know, the piece of ground, and what's appropriate to the people that have to exist in that space. And finding a way to successfully marry those things together and do it in a way that fits the budget. And the budget may be staged. It may be immediate. Everybody has a different situation, right? But communication, it all comes down to communication. Do you find that working with people, do they have unrealistic expectations? Like when you're teaching people, does that help you adjust like your advice? Some people are really realistic. Some people are incredibly unrealistic. And I think the reality is a lot of people don't know. They just don't know. 
you know, and if you go out and you hire a designer, I mean, I face this in my house because I don't know how to do interior design and architecture at that level. And, you know, you go and you hire somebody and you get this design done and then you go and you get it priced to build it. And you're like, oh, <laughs> I can't do that. And I think one of the first conversations I have, because I work as a consultant and coach, so I don't have any reward financially if somebody decides to build because I don't do build. So I make my money as a consultant and as a designer, but then to say, you know, what is your budget? And their answer may be, I don't know, or it may be a question, what should it be? You know, and then some of the conversation becomes, are you going to be here for three years? Or are you going to be here for the rest of your life? How old are you? When you build a house, you finish it and you move in and, you know, the walls are up and the building's habitable. With a garden, you know, you can make choices. It's going to grow. So do you buy a tiny little Japanese maple or a really big one? Because you're old and you want to get some shade from it before you die. Thinking about all these different things informs how you approach design and how you communicate with the customer, no matter what their approach is. And no matter how unrealistic they may be in the beginning, there's a way to make a garden realistic. When I went to school, you know, we were taught to do cell designs as the entire landscape, no matter what it was, you want to do the whole design all at once. So it has cohesion. So I was like, okay, they taught me this. And then over time, I started realizing that doesn't make sense. Because in many situations, it doesn't make sense. Because most people can't afford to drop 30 to 100 grand on an entire landscape, let's say, could be more, could be less. And if they can't do it all at once, by the time they get to another area, they may move, their kids may grow up and they never created the playground. So now it's time to do something different there. So then they pay for another design. So, you know, trying to understand what the client really needs is the best way for me to help them get past any kind of expectation or confusion they may have about the process. What is your favorite type of client or project to work with? I have to say, I really love the people that are super passionate about it, that really, really want to learn. You know, I have one client that I started working with as a coach, and she's become one of my very best friends in this world. But she also went on to become an award-winning designer at the Northwest Flower and Garden Show twice. And it's a hobby for her. She loves it. And so she you know, seeing people find success, it's just what feeds me. Yesterday, I had one of my herbalism students came up to visit and we went out foraging and she gathered stuff from my property. And we also went out together and seeing her starting to launch her own soap making business and really pivoting her background in Western medicine into this maker market business that she's building out. I mean, that feeds me. You know, we talk about success. Some people are like, oh, it's all about the money. And I'm like, no, I don't chase the money. I chase the empowerment I can give to other people. 100%. Just your passion for food and creating food and how important that is, not only from a health perspective, but from, you know, just an origin perspective. So how much does that drive you into teaching that part of gardening? It drives me a lot. You know, food gardening has been a part of my life ever since I can possibly remember. And it's something people are really interested in. Whether I, I lead a nature walk, which pre-COVID, I did those monthly at an environmental learning center. I would take people out in nature and teach them about the native plants. And the questions you get a lot are, can I eat it? Can I eat it? What do I do with it? Can I eat it? You know, and we eat. You know, food sharing is how we socialize and how we gift each other at kind of the most primal level, right? And growing food is just that next step in that food experience for humans. And a lot of my clients will call me about food gardening lessons, and it's parents that never grew up the way I did, learning about it on a farm. And they haven't necessarily been particularly interested in it but their kids are asking. So we're seeing a generation that maybe sort of was this gap food growing generation being driven by this upcoming generation that really wants to learn. 
And then with that, you know, foraging is huge. People are so interested in it. And I think it's so important to learn about the ethics of it before you go out and just start doing it. Because we do have problems with over harvesting and uneducated harvesting. I worry every time I see somebody on Facebook asking for identification of mushrooms online because those things will kill you. <laughs> They will kill you fast. And so will a lot of other plants, including a lot of herbs that we do use, but they can be toxic. So being able to kind of teach people about these things in ways that are hopefully approachable and ways that they can do things in incremental phases is really important to me, whether it's food or herbs, whether it's herbs for your external body or your internal body. And then also looking at how all of those impact the greater ecology that we might be developing. I mean, if you came to my garden, you would probably just be like, she can't possibly be a professional because of the number of weeds I let grow and because of my level of tolerance for messiness. But I know that a lot of those things that a lot of people will perceive as weeds I know are herbs that I'm gonna to put to good use, whether it's allowing pollinators to feed on them. So the pollinators come and pollinate my orchard and my berries, or whether it's a weed I let grow because I know that the wild rabbits will eat that weed before they go and eat my lettuce, or whether it's a weed I let grow because there's no way I can possibly defeat it because it's prehistoric and it predates anything here. So I think there's, a lot to be said about, you know, learning about plants in terms of how we eat them and preserve them and can integrate them in our lives these ways. Well, looking to the future, I mean, I know that the Northwest Flower and Garden Show has been such a, you know, important part of your journey. It's coming back next year. I'm guessing you're looking forward to that. Is there any other things you're looking forward to as COVID hopefully starts waning? I am in the process of finishing my speaker pitches for the Northwest Flower and Garden Show. I've definitely been invited back. Very excited about that. I'm really curious to see what it's going to be like. You know, that was the last big event before COVID shut everything down. I mean, that nobody got sick there. We dodged a bullet. I am also excited. There's a small outdoor program coming up this summer called Plantasia. I hope that as things open up, I can resume my volunteer work, doing nature walks, because I just meet amazing people and can share with everyone in one of my favorite spaces, which is the Padilla Bay Environmental Research Center near my home here. And then I also teach hands-on lessons there. And I'm hoping as things open up, I'll be able to teach more herbal lessons. And so I'm looking forward to being able to get back with my people. I think we all are, but I'm also super thrilled to continue to expand the online academy and be able to teach anybody anywhere how to garden smart and do all of these other things in nature. I think it's really important that we work with educated people to learn about these things. And hopefully I can be that for a number of people. Well, Robin, I've known you such a long time and, you know, your business in a field that, as we've talked about, is intimidated to me is one that I admire so much. And I love, love, love how you're making all aspects of gardening and horticulture so accessible to people. It makes you, to me, one of the biggest badasses I know. So what do you think makes you a badass? What makes me a badass? Oh boy, I don't know. I think the ability to look at things in a holistic manner and to not just see the tree, but to see the entire forest and to look up and look down and dig deep and take a deep breath and really connect to the space I'm in before I try to modify it or teach someone else to modify it. Thank you so much for being part of this podcast. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And I really feel honored that you invited me on. I mean, you are truly a badass. I mean, I look at all that you do and I know you do it because it's a passion and I get that. And I think you might be a little bit like me that if you only did one thing, you'd get bored and feel stagnated. And so you just keep pursuing and, you know, just keep doing what you do. And it's beautiful. And I'm so blessed to have you as a friend and a mentor. Thanks, Robin. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Lawyer Who Rocks. 
If you've enjoyed it and want to hear more from business badasses, make sure you hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. While you're at it, please give us a review. It really helps us grow the show. The Lawyer Who Rocks is produced by Sean Fox and HMLG. If you've got an idea for a podcast, you can find Sean online at sfpodcast.com. A big thank you to Aaron Jones for our theme music, to Jeff Gilbert at Hairball Media for our awesome artwork, and thanks to my entire team at HMLG. If you need a lawyer who rocks, find us at hmlglaw.com. On the next episode, you know, we talk about success. Some people are like, oh, it's all about the money. And I'm like, no, I don't chase the money. I chase the empowerment I can give to other people. This podcast has been brought to you by HMLG. If you need lawyers who rock, visit us on our website at hmlglaw.com or be sure to follow us on social media at hmlglaw or at the lawyer who rocks on all social media platforms. Bugs, you're going to have to go outside, buddy. (laughs) Uh, Oh, video. Sorry. There I am.